What's up, Math Ninjas? Mr. Antonucci here, and I want to share with you my expert tips, my top expert tips for how to get a five on the AP Calculus AB exam. I've been teaching AP Calculus for over 15 years at the time of the recording of this video, and I've gone through countless AP exams. I've gone to AP seminars. I've gone to their summer institute. Uh, I've, I've taught students for years. I've gone through dozens and dozens and dozens of free response questions. I've graded hundreds of students uh, free response questions using the scoring guidelines set up by uh, the College Board. And so I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on some of these tips for how to get a five on the AP exam. And I'm not going to share, you know, your traditional, you know, make sure you read the whole question, make sure you get a good night's sleep, make sure you eat a full breakfast, those kind of things, process of elimination on multiple choice questions. No, these are going to be things specific to AP calculus that are really going to help you. So let's dive right in. Um, this is just going to be me talking. So you can pause this video, take some notes, slow it down, speed it up, whatever you need to do. Um, but these are things are going to be very valuable for you. And just listening to this and even taking notes is going to spark things in your mind when you go to take the exam that are going to help you get a five. It's, they're going to help you get that extra couple of points to pop you over the threshold to get, you know, maybe you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to get a five, but maybe it can pop you from getting a two up to a three and really getting college credit for your college or pop you to get from a three to a four and so forth and so on. Also, I'm, I, I didn't mean to imply that if you get a three, you will get college credit. It's dependent on your college and what their requirements are. I was just using that as a general example. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about free response questions. I'm gonna, and, and a lot of this stuff is gonna um, apply to both free response and multiple choice questions. So you are allowed to use your graphing calculator for four main things, calculating a de derivative, the value of a derivative, the value of a definite integral, graphing a function in an arbitrary viewing window and solving an equation. You can do that graphically by graphing both equations and using the calculate menu to solve for the intersection point. That being said, when you are on a calculator allowed problem, do use your calculator to calculate values of derivatives, values of definite integrals, but you can't use uh, calculator notation if you have an older style calculator. You have to use correct notation, F prime of pi equals 2.8731 or whatever it is. You have to write down the correct definite integral with the limits and those kinds of things. Another thing that comes up oftentimes is you will need to solve for the intersection point of two functions or two graphs of functions and then you use those intersection points or point somewhere in the problem. These are, these are typically whenever you have a problem where you have to find the area of a region between two graphs or find the volume of a solid of revolution or with known cross sections, those kinds of problems, typically you'll have to solve for the intersection point you have to write down the equation that you are solving to get the intersection points for. You don't have to show all the algebra. In fact, most of the time, if it's a calculator allowed portion, you're not going to be able to solve the equation graphically. But you do need to write down the equation graphically, or excuse me, that you're solving graphically. Write the equation down, and then underneath that, write the intersection points, whether you're solving for the x value or the y value, or both the x and y value, like the coordinate of the intersection point. Another thing is often um, when you are putting limits on an integral, a definite integral, when you're writing that down, those limits have to be accurate to three decimal places. Um, in fact, all of your answers have to be accurate to at least three decimal places unless you're putting an exact answer. If the, if the, exact, if the answer is like, pi, like three pi squared, then write three pi squared. But um, if the answer is 2.76948321, whatever, you just have to go out three decimal places and you can either chop it off at three decimal places or round to the third decimal place. So the number pi is a very good example for this. It's 3.1415 is the fourth decimal place. So you could write 3.141 or you could round to 3.142. And they would accept both of those. You can go more than three decimal places, but after the third decimal place, it doesn't matter what you write. They're not going. They're just looking at the, those three decimal places. So, 
if the answer were pi and you were writing down the decimal and you put 3.14, it would be considered wrong because that's not accurate to three decimal places. Okay, so just keep that in mind with these types of problems. While we're on the topic of rounding, so for example, if you're writing a definite integral, the limits, oftentimes they will give you a point for the limits on it. Sometimes they might, sometimes they might not, but this is going to apply. For the point for the limits, your limits themselves have to be accurate to three decimal places. Okay. Now, when you calculate the value of that definite integral, that answer also needs to be accurate to at least three decimal places. But here's what can happen. If you use a rounded answer in an intermediate step that is rounded to three decimal places to then get another answer, use that to get the next answer that you then round to three decimal places, that final answer may not be accurate to three decimal places, even though you rounded it to three decimal places because you used another rounded number to get that number, okay? So my advice to you is for all intermediate steps, make sure you go out as many decimal places as you can when calculating the next line of the answer, okay? Or you can use the storing feature on your graphing calculator. I'm not going to explain how to do all of that storing feature, but you can store any number you want as an as a, uh, alpha letter and then use that letter in your calculations on the, on the calculator um, to make it more simple. So if you're going out like eight, nine decimal places and you transpose two of the digits every time you type it in or it makes the thing you're typing in very, very complicated, um, this simplifies that process. Okay, so um, let's talk about theorems a little bit. There are some main theorems that we talk about in AP Calculus. This is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just going to give you a couple examples. The extreme value theorem, the intermediate value theorem, and the mean value theorem are three of the most popular ones that we talk about. Often in free response questions, there is at least one question in the six that you'll get that asks you to make a conclusion or a justification based upon those theorems. So what you wanna do is make sure you know the conditions of those theorems, know how they apply and what the result is or what it means in the context uh, of using that theorem. So that whenever you are appealing to that theorem as part of a justification or showing why a theorem applies, you can explain how the function or the situation satisfies the conditions of that theorem, and then also be able to explain how the result applies in the problem. So it's important that you understand what are the conditions, what has to be true about the function for this theorem to apply, and then what that result is. Another thing that I see come up a lot, and this typically is with problems where they ask you to justify if a point is a relative max, a relative min, or a point of inflection. Students often want to just like graph the function and say, because of the graph. The graph itself is not a sufficient justification. Also, just putting like a number line with a sign chart in it or a table with a sign chart is typically not going to be sufficient justification. In order to justify that you have a relative max, a relative min, uh, you're going to have to use the first or second derivative test. So make sure you know how to apply the first or second derivative test and explain how that proves that you have a relative max or a relative min. Similarly, the same holds true with a point of inflection. You have to be able to use um, the test for concavity and be able to show that you have a point of inflection at a particular point. Um, that being said, with a point of inflection, one of the most common mistakes I see students make is they think that a point of inflection only occurs or automatically occurs when the second derivative is equal to zero. Well, that may or may not be true. That, that's not enough. A possible point of inflection occurs when the second derivative is zero or undefined, but also the second derivative must change sign as the function passes over that point. Okay. Or the other way is that if you have a relative max or relative min, a relative extrema on the first derivative, that implies a point of inflection of the graph, okay? So while we're talking about extrema, make sure you also understand the distinction between when a problem is asking for a relative or local max or min or extrema and an absolute or global max or min or extrema. 
Okay, because how you justify a local max or min, you need to use the first or second derivative test. But for an absolute extrema, you can use what, what's called the candidates test. And the candidates test is just, you find the points of the endpoints of the interval. So it's, it's gonna be a closed interval, typically, if they're asking for an ap absolute extrema. So you find the, you get the, uh, the values for the endpoints and the values for the critical numbers. And then you just compare them. And the highest of those is the, the absolute max and the lowest of those values is the absolute min. And there you can set up a table if you want for the candidates test, because that's how you show what a global max or a global min is. Um, let's see, let's go here. Also, make sure you know the values of the six trig functions in their special angles. So like theta is zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, um, and then all the other corresponding angles as you go through all four quadrants of the unit circle. Now, really, you can boil it down to finding to just memorizing the values of sine and cosine in the first quadrant for zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, and pi over two. And then use the symmetry of the unit circle and the sign changes of whether you're in quadrant two, three, or four um, to get those other special values of the trig functions. Because on the calculator not allowed portion of either the free response or multiple choice, they can ask you to find the value of a trig function, of a trig function at one of these special angles. Uh, the reason I say you just need to, to really memorize sine and cosine is because you can get the other four trig functions from just sine and cosine. For example, uh, tangent is sine divided by cosine, and then uh, secant and cosecant are the reciprocal functions, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent or cosine over sine. So really, if you know sine and cosine, the special values in the first quadrant, and then how the, the symmetry of how the unit circle works, to get, you know, whether, you know, uh, the answer is positive or negative. Um, you really only need to know those things in the first quadrant to be able to know everything. Now, another thing that, that often comes up is students misunderstand what the question is asking based on the function they're speaking about. And what I mean by that is, as you know, when you get to calculus, you're not just talking about a function. We talk about a function. We talk about its first derivative. We talk about its second derivative. And we can also talk about its antiderivative. So you really have like four layers of functions that you can talk about there. So lots of times I'll see students mistakenly look at a problem that gives you a graph. This is when it comes up the most. And they say, look at the, the graph of F prime is given. And then they ask questions about the, the function F. Okay, so make sure you look at the problem carefully. Is the information that they give you in terms of the function, its first, fu first derivative, second derivative, uh, its definite integral, um, is the function defined as an integral? Um, is the function defined in terms of other functions? We'll get to that in a second. So what they, they often will do is they'll give you the, the function in terms of the original, the first derivative, the second derivative, or a definite integral. And then they will ask you questions um, about other levels, if you will, of that function. So for example, they might give you the graph of f and ask you questions about f, um, excuse me, they'll give you the, the function of the derivative, the graph of the derivative, and ask you questions about the original function or the second derivative or any combination of those things. So just be careful with that. Um, another thing that they do is they will often define a function in terms of other functions. So for example, maybe they give you the graph of f of x, and then they'll say, g of x is defined as x cubed times f of x. And then they'll ask you, like, what's the value of g prime of 3? OK, so just be careful uh, and read carefully and look carefully um, at what they are giving you and what they are asking you. Some problems refer to multiple functions in a single problem. I've, I've seen this um, many times. One example that comes up to me is a problem where they have two different velocity functions and they're asking you different questions about the, the one velocity function versus the other velocity function, and then things about both of the velocity functions at the same time. So when there are multiple functions involved, and I, I've seen problems where they're talking about three, even four different functions in the course of one problem, make sure you carefully look at which one each question is referring to. Okay, so be careful there. Um, 
with free response questions, make sure you put units on every single answer of a problem that has units. I've seen so many free response questions where it's like one point for the units, one point for the units. And if you have nine points on a free response question and you miss the units point, that's 11% of the of the of that problem just for forgetting about the units um so be careful there now i mentioned velocity a minute ago know the difference between speed and velocity sometimes they will ask about speed sometimes they will ask about velocity just know that speed is the absolute value of velocity while we're on that another thing is the distinction between total distance traveled, displacement, and final position. Okay, Displacement is just the definite integral of the velocity function over the interval. And that tells you um, how far it moved from beginning to end. It doesn't tell you the total steps necessarily, but just how far it is from where it started to where it landed, whatever the object is. Okay, Final position is just displacement plus the initial position. So it's how much it moved from where it started plus where it started gives you where it ended up, final position, okay? And then total distance traveled is the definite integral of the absolute value of velocity. So what happens is a fun, uh, an object can move forward and backward. So let's say you move five steps forward and three steps back. Well, your total distance traveled is eight steps but your displacement would only be two steps because now you move five steps forward and three steps back. Now you're only two steps from where you started. Okay, uh, let's talk about solids of revolution. When they are doing volume problems with rotations in them, one thing you want to keep in mind is that the slice, whether you're using the disc method or the washer method or donut method, I don't know what, what your teacher called it, but uh, the slice, the representative slice of for how you get your radius is always, always, always going to be perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So if you have a vertical axis of rotation, you're rotating it like this, your slice is going to be perpendicular to that. You're going to make a horizontal slice for the radius, okay? And, and whatever axis that slice would eventually intersect, even if it doesn't actually intersect an axis, the thickness of where it would intersect the axis is what variable you want to integrate with respect to. So if you have a vertical axis of rotation, your slice is going to be horizontal, okay? And that slice would intersect basically the y-axis. So your thickness of that slice is going to be on the y-axis. That's your dy. That tells you to integrate with respect to y. Similarly, if your axis um, of rotation is horizontal, you're going to make a vertical slice. And the thickness of that slice will eventually intersect the x-axis, if even if it doesn't realistically intersect the x-axis ever. Um, if you continue that slice down or up, the thickness of that slice would be dx. And so you know to integrate with respect to x. OK, so these are some of the tips that I have. I'm sure you could think of some more. Uh, if you do, let, let me know in the comments below so that other people can benefit from your knowledge as well. Also, check out the video that I did on um, everything you must know cold for the AP Calculus exam. There, I go through all the rules and theorems and things that you need to know. Uh, for the AP Calculus exam. Uh, tons of people watch that video and, and I've gotten a lot of comments and feedback that it, it's been very, very helpful. So good luck this year as you're taking the AP Calc exam. Hope this video was helpful. Again, let me know. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well and hit the bell for notifications when new videos are uploaded. All right now, take care and good luck.